Hey, Eleanor, nice to see you. This is fantastic. Hi, yeah, really glad to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Absolutely. And again, uh, we have been uh, to Uganda, Seychelles, uh, Kenya, and more in the last few hours. Uh, before I dive with an introduction for you, Eleanor, I just want to say for everyone online, uh, Joe's been mentioning this in all our broadcasts, but uh, the point of this festival, one of our goals was to encourage people to donate in support of six incredible conservation organizations. We have well exceeded our goal for our fundraisers. So we are thrilled at contributions from all over Canada, the US, UK, and more. Um, so with every extra dollar we get, we are going to be feeding that right back into the conservation organizations you guys have seen today. Again, the last hour, Conservation Through Public Health, Owasso Lions, just incredible places, incredible people, all passionate about conservation. So thank you so, so much for that. Gladys from our last presentation too is, is killing it in our backyard bio uh, goal. So hashtag backyard bio, we're encouraging people to submit things from their backyard. She has a hornbill, one of the most beautiful birds on earth. So your goal on YouTube is to top that from our, our 80 plus countries that are tuning in. Uh, that is awesome, way to go Gladys. All right, without further ado. So we just finished talking about the, the dense rainforest of Uganda, one of the most beautiful places in the world in search of the giant that is the mountain gorilla. And I think we're going to be searching for a little bit of a different giant with you, Eleanor. So Eleanor is a researcher who is going to share her huge passion for animal behavior and insects specifically, uh, diving through with nocturnal field work, crazy stuff in forests, uh, dodging rainstorms, avoiding lightning bolts, all in pursuit of the Titan beetle, uh, one of the coolest insects on earth. It's so nice as a huge insect lover myself to get to dive in with it. So thanks so much for joining us, Eleanor, and let's let's blow some minds together. Great. Well, thanks so much for that brilliant introduction. I'm I'm really glad to hear that you're keen on invertebrates. I feel like everyone should be. Um, Okay, so so should I uh, dive into the? Let's dive in. Let's see the okay. cool slides. Okay, right. So hopefully you'll be able to see these. Oh. Okay, so so hopefully today I am going to take you on a little bit of an adventure to investigate one of the coolest animals on the planet in the depths of the French Guianan rainforest. So. I'm an entomologist and I very much believe that we are in a golden age of discovery when it comes to invertebrates. There are new species being described pretty much every day. You can't open an entomological journal without coming across crazy new species of beetle or, or centipede or, or dancing spiders. And that's you know, just something happening on a daily basis, particularly in areas like this in French Guiana, where there are thousands and thousands of species left to be discovered. And it's not just the descriptions of the species themselves, it's also the incredible amount of knowledge that's still to be learned about their behaviors. Um, so we are just beginning to scratch the surface of understanding invertebrate behavior. It's only recently been realized that invertebrates can have personality or even use tools. However, this kind of immense kind of gaps in our knowledge, both of what is out there and what they do is, is for me very exciting because there's so much opportunities to discover something new, but also slightly terrifying because places like this in French Guiana are very threatened by different kind of threats like logging or, or, or mining. And, um, you know, it's a, a real possibility that we can lose such a lot without even knowing that they exist. And me, this kind of like, um, you know, kind of almost light bulb moment or kind of wake up call came many years ago now when I was doing my master's at the Natural History Museum in London. Um, and I came across a specimen of a time beetle. So it's so something that looked a little bit like this. And I was just blown away by this. As an entomologist, this is just you know, absolutely crazy. And and it's an absolutely lovely photo here. This just shows how large it is. Um, the, 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 the little tiny creature um, over to the side is the smallest beetle on the planet and it is the biggest beetle on the planet. So it's just, it's just, just an absolute kind of gorgeous monster when you look at it. Um, so these things grow to be 18 centimeters long, which is just, you know, just mind boggling. And, you know, I come from a animal behavior background. My, my research focuses on, um, the, in particular, uh, the, the personality of invertebrates uh, with a specialism on kind of roly-polies or, or wood lice, as we call them in the UK. Um, and th those are, you know, they're quite small invertebrates and they're over, often kind of overlooked. So I was so excited to come across this creature because I was like, oh my goodness, this can't have been overlooked. There must have been hundreds of studies done on this incredible creature. And so, Anyway, I went, I went to the library, as, as any good entomologist does when they find a new species that they're interested in. 
only to find that there was pretty much nothing written on this species. And that for me was just completely crazy. The fact that you had something that's so big and so charismatic, and yet we, we know so little about it. And, you know, by extinction, if we know so little about the largest beetle on the planet, what does that say about how little we know about so many of the other incredible species that are out there? So, so this kind of became a little bit of a, a, an obsession for me in, in the best possible way. Um, and I started trying to piece together kind of almost like a little bit of a jigsaw as much as I could about this particular species. So, so we know very little about this particular species. Um, but it, this species uh, belongs in the, the longhorn beetle family. Um, and it is, so, so you can investigate other species within that family in order to kind of get a bit of a feel about what might be going on with this species. And what I learned from that kind of really blew my mind. Like we reckon based on what we know from other species is that these creatures have an incredible life cycle in which they are a larvae, possibly for about kind of 10 years, um, living probably underground and rotting wood for about you know 10 years before they emerge as an adult like you, you see here this is a this is a I think it's a male um and before they emerge and you can see it, he has amazing uh, mandibles but they have no actual digestive system so despite the fact that they have mouth parts they can't actually digest any food so they only have a matter of weeks before they actually starve to death despite having this uh, this incredible life cycle as as a larvae so so you know this kind of you know, got me even more interested in the species. And so as well as drawing kind of bits and pieces from other species, another way that you can learn about a species in which there's not very much known is kind of talking to entomologists who've been in the field trying to catch these themselves, or even um, people who are collecting them for kind of personal reasons or commercial reasons. Um, th these species are very, very valuable. Um, you can buy them for about 200 pounds to about 600 pounds. So there's quite a lot of people who go over there to try and collect them. So you can get a lot of information from kind of anecdotal sources like that too. And so from that, we found out that um, you're most likely to find them in um, the French Guyane in, or the, the Guyane in Shield, which is a kind of really lovely, dense part of rainforest. Um, you're likely to find them at night and they only emerge for a few weeks during the rainy season. Um, all of these reasons are, are probably very good reasons why not very many people have studied them. However, we didn't let that put us off. And after many years of, of kind of like trying to piece together all these amazing pieces of information about this beetle, finally, with the, the support of the, the Scientific Exploration Society, I was able to team up with um, a couple of people in order to go and try and study these. So, so I teamed up with Laura Kaur and uh, Chris Gagari Peel. And these guys were just amazing. So, so Laura, she is the person to to go to if you are interested in plants at all. And so, for, for something like this, where we we're interested in looking at the habitat of the species, she was completely amazing on this expedition. And also, so Chris, he is a very very talented uh, filmmaker. He's also a brilliant person to go with on this type of expedition. Um, so we we headed out to to a place um, called the Core Core Regions. Um, in order to to try and and find these species, um, so th th this expedition had two main aims. So the first expedition aim was to try and uh, collect uh, footage of this beetle, um, in order for Chris to put together a, a short film, kind of highlighting this species and also kind of wider uh, questions about in invertebrate conservation. And then the second aim was to try and collect some uh, behavioural data on this species. But as you can imagine, it's very very challenging to um, try and study a species of beetle in the wild. Um, so we had to be a little bit creative about how we would collect this data. And what we decided on in the end was we, we approached a company um, with the specifications of dimensions of the beetles that we got from museum specimens um, in order to get them to design a, a pip tag that was kind of specifically designed for this beetle. So that was quite exciting to kind of work with them to come up with this new type of tag. Um, so yeah, we were very excited to take those into the field and kind of try them out for the first time. We didn't know whether they were going to work or, or anything, but it was a really exciting um, thing to, to be involved with. So, so this is a photo of um, the rainforest in which we were working. And as you can see, it's absolutely, absolutely gorgeous uh, rainforest. 
And uh, so the first thing for us to do was to, to find a, a clearing and set up a light trap. So, so a light trap is a, essentially it's very simple. It's just a, a white sheet that you set up um, with a, a giant light that you kind of power by, usually a car battery or in our case, we use the generator. Um, and then you kind of sit and wait, um, which, is great, um, except for the fact that this can be somewhat problematic uh, during the rainy season. So I've just got a two minute clip, uh, a two second clip kind of showing you uh, what the kind of conditions are like so you can get a little bit of a, a feel for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so this was gorgeous. Um, we would uh, describe these conditions as a little bit sticky or a little bit crunchy, um, which, uh, which kind of sums it up. Um, uh, yeah, so so the interesting thing about Titan beetles too is they didn't make our jobs easy because most invertebrates you can see like um, the, the moths that have landed on the the, moth, uh, the the light trap already they come straight to it so it's very easy then to go and collect them. Titan beetles on the other hand we don't know why but they they end up just kind of sitting on in the kind of edge of the pool of light so they don't come into the pool of light they kind of sit on the edge so which means that you can't just sit in your nice little shelter you have to regularly go out into the rain and, and check to see if you can find these uh, these, these beetles. Um, I think the other really good thing, though, is uh, if you are working in the rainy season, well, there's definite benefits. Um, so, for example, uh, there's so many frogs at this time of year and so many snakes. So, so, uh, so they're different kind of brighten up in evening. So I would recommend working in the, in the rainy season, even if it looks a little bit sticky. Um, but yeah, so, 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 so we set up our, our light trap at about kind of 9 p.m. And then you'd kind of sit uh, like this until about kind of, you know, 2 a.m. or something kind of waiting for, for something to happen. Anyway, after the first night, nothing had happened. And this was pretty terrifying because I've already mentioned that, you know, you only have a matter of weeks in which these animals are active. But actually, you're also battling with the lunar cycle at the same time. You can only catch these beetles when it's really dark, which means that if you have a full moon, there's no way that you're going to catch these beetles. So, so even if we had a, um, you know, a few weeks, in reality, you only have a, a few days in which it is actually possible to catch these beetles. So the first night when nothing turned up, we were kind of pretty terrified that we were going to come all this way and not catch a single thing, which is a very, you know, one of the, the dangers of working with animals. And uh, so anyway, we, we set up the, the next night, as you, as you can imagine, we're all in high spirits uh, after this with uh, another day um similar weather to the night before however this time at about 11 o'clock we, we we were kind of sitting there and then suddenly there was a noise it almost sounded like someone had like thrown a tennis ball into the grass so we kind of hopped up to see what it was and and this this is this is what we found and i can honestly tell you that this was probably the most exciting moment of my entire life um this individual he is a really healthy um great specimen of a, of a male he was about 15 centimeters long and it turns out that, that uh, something we didn't realize is that they are incredibly aggressive. Um, so as you can see there, he, he's having a good old go to try and uh, take me out. Um, and uh, their, their claws actually draw blood as well. And anecdotally, apparently, according to some of the other entomologists we met, so if they, they bite you, they can bite you to the bones. We had to be pretty, pretty careful. Um, in fact, they, they were so aggressive that once we released them, they, you, they would run off and then attack the first thing that they came across, which is usually like a tree or like a bush. And they just sit there trying to like tear apart and you'll be like, oh, Oh dear, you have some anger management issues. Um, but uh, anyway, so so the first thing to do was us to uh, to kind of weigh and measure the, these animals, which was uh, kind of difficult given how aggressive they were. Um, but we, we we caught three altogether that night: um, two large ones and one quite small one. And so the next thing to do after kind of weighing them and measuring them was to then try and uh, put the tags on them. Um, so, so this is how we, we, we did it. Uh, we used just a little bit of glue and we kind of popped the tag on the back um, and uh, we found that the best way to stop getting bitten was uh, to distract him with a, with a piece of stick. So that's, that's what's going on there. Um, but, but yeah, so, so we eventually managed to get all the tags on, on the beetles and uh, then release them back into the wild. So as you can imagine, we were like so excited to, to get out there and, and see what, you know, what, what had happened, you know, where have they gone, you know, whether or not these tags had worked as well. Anyway, we came around the corner and it was a real kind of heart in the stomach moment as we discovered that somebody uh, like a commercial invertebrate collector had set up his trapping gear about 30 centimeters away from where we had released the beetles, which would mean that the moment it got dark, they'd go straight to his uh, trap. And uh, we didn't think we were gonna get them back because, you know, as I mentioned before, these beetles can be, you know, worth like 200 to 500 pounds. Um, so the, the likelihood of us ever getting these animals back was just, 
minuscule. Luckily for us, um, this individual, he was very, very kind and he let us um, use our trackers to, to find the beetles that we'd released the next the, the previous day. So we were able to uh, kind of rescue uh, the beetles that had already been tagged. But this then left us with a, a big conundrum. You know, we'd been planning to release them exactly where we'd, we'd left them. Um, and so we were really worried about, you know, what we would do next. But lucky for us, uh, we weren't alone in this. Um, we'd been working already with, uh, we've been in touch already with uh, SIAG, which are an amazing network of people in, in French Guiana. These guys, they are all volunteers and they go out pretty much every weekend in order to um, collect invertebrates, uh, to describe new species, um, and also to monitor the decline in populations associated with uh, mining in the local areas. So they do an amazing job. And uh, this is Frederic and he very, very kindly um, came to our, our rescue to give us advice. He is probably one of the world's uh, leading experts in um, longhorn beetles of French Guiana, so he's the man to talk to. And uh, so uh, with his advice, we were able to find a, a new location that was kind of close enough to the original location that it wouldn't disrupt the behavior of these beetles, but also far enough away that it would mean that they wouldn't instantly be caught by this trap at the moment we released them. Um, on top of that, we decided that, you know, on the case that they did end up getting trapped or, or we lost the, the tags and were unable to find out what happened to them, we decided to collect a little bit of uh, data in the lab. Unfortunately, we didn't have a lab in the jungle, but what we did have was a kitchen. So this is our kitchen to start with. And it actually turns out that kitchens make for very good laboratories. And so this was uh, what it looked like after we were done with it. Um, and yeah, well, I, I was quite pleased about how it went. You know, I, I feel like everyone should have a, a, a beetle arena rather than the kitchen. Um, and we were able to use this to release the beetles in one, one at a time because they're quite, as I mentioned, they're quite aggressive. Um, and then measure their activity levels over the path of the day in order to get a bit of a feel for, for what times of day they are most active. And then after we'd um, collected a, a little bit of data in that way, we were then able to release them back into the field um, with the tags to have a look at their activities uh, in the wild. And uh, yeah, this is, this is one of the individuals that we uh, released after watching him in captivity. So, so what did we find? Well, from an entomological uh, perspective, this was really exciting. It was so exciting to um, trial these tags for the first time and kind of get some feedback in order to come up with different uh, recommendations of ways to improve these kind of prototype tags. So that was really exciting. Um, we were also able to find out that actually they're not quite as nocturnal as we thought. So that was a really exciting insight. And finally, we were also able to get some images of um, the little nests they actually kind of make for themselves to hide during the day. So that was really exciting. We're trying to get those uh, written up at the moment to try and get those published because, you know, really, uh, you know, exciting findings. But also, as well as the scientific side of things, another part of this expedition that, that was really exciting for me was the kind of public engagement side. So, so Chris... Um, I did an absolutely amazing job uh, during this expedition to get some really lovely footage. Um, and in fact, all of the images and uh, films, in fact, all of the ones that are any good are all due to him. All the ones that are terrible are mine. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he did a brilliant uh, job of getting some really good footage and, and really good images and put together um, a lovely uh, short film kind of highlighting um, the species and, and conservation challenges. And we've actually been able to show this film to about a thousand people now. And the, the really exciting thing for me is that in the same way that I had my kind of light bulb moment about quite how little we know about invertebrates when I came across this uh, specimen in the Natural History Museum, one of the exciting things of being able to come back and show this film is that particularly when you go into schools and show school kids, you see the people having the same light bulb um, moment. Uh, which hopefully, I really hope, will kind of hopefully spark some interesting uh, discussions and uh, thoughts about conservation of invertebrates in general. So, so yeah, so, so that's kind of all I have to say about uh, this particular expedition, but I really hope that I've kind of given you a little bit of a feel about what it was like to be in the field looking for these animals and also a little bit of a sense of quite how little we know overall um, in, with invertebrates and how exciting that is. And uh, well, uh, finally, um, I'd like to thank the uh, SEAG who kind of helped us out so much, as well as all the funders who made this possible, particularly the Scientific Exploration Society. Outstanding. 
Uh, so keep that slide up for a second. Everyone who's tuning in on YouTube can check that all out and then come out of screen share and we'll have a little bit of a conversation and share some questions. Great. How do I? Uh, on top of your screen, big red button. Oh, stop share. There Great. you go. Sorry. <laughs> and don't be sorry at all. So, okay. So much to unpack. Uh, I, you know, the thrill, I think, for people tuning in on YouTube, and again, 80 plus countries have tuned in over the last day and a half, and certainly the thrill for me as a host is not even so much the, the work that organizations do and the work that's been into the field, it's the passion. We've had people from so many countries that are so thrilled with what they do. And truly, I mean, even by the standard of the people that we brought on, um, if people in your lives, if you in your life can find something or someone you love as much as you love support, <laughs> You are, you're set. Like, that's all you need. I don't think you blinked for 22 minutes, which might be a world record. Uh, is, no, but seriously, like, this is amazing. I'm so thrilled you could share this story with us today. And it's so beautiful. And we'd love a link to that video. We'd love to share that out through our, our social media, through Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and more, um, to keep the learning going because, yeah, not Okay. Um, also, the line uh, shall live in infamy. I feel like everyone should have a beetle arena rather than a kitchen. Thank you for that in my day. Um, so a great question from Stephen in England, uh, just to kick us off on Slido. Um, he, he's super excited that we can see the, the Titan Beetle Day. Um, he bought one when he was 10 in 1981. Oh, wow. And he wanted to ask, do you think the sale of this beetle should be prohibited because of their status? Ooh, now this is a really difficult question, um, which I don't think I have a good answer to. I, I'd say that overall, we need to study more to understand more about uh, the invertebrate trade. Um, but I would say that it's difficult to know. I, I'd, I'd definitely say that not all trade in invertebrates is bad. There's you know some very beneficial trade in invertebrates, um, but overall there really needs to be more research done. Yeah. And that's something that we, we keep coming back to in, in our presentations over the last week is that there's so much more to learn um, and that there are some, you know, sort of unexpected ways that we can contribute to conservation. But again, the more we know, the better informed we'll be able to make those decisions. So great question. Exactly. Uh, so you, you highlighted uh, and in this presentation showcased your, your love of educating the public about this sort of thing. How do you find that interaction goes like when you've talked with kids and you shared this video? What's the response been? Because as we said, you know, gorillas was our last presentation. Yeah. Everyone is behind gorillas. Like there's no one who says, I hate <laughs> gorillas, doesn't happen. But insects are something that freak a lot of people out. And, and you know, <laughs> how have you dealt with that? And like, and what's the response been? Has it been uniformly positive? I think that this is one of the really great things about uh, projects like this that, that that focus on one particular like really charismatic uh, species because you know as I said my specialism is actually in in woodlice and so so sometimes it's quite difficult to get kids excited about woodlice whereas if you go to a school and you show them a film of a beetle the size of a puppy suddenly you, you know they kind of like they almost like kind of switch on and they're just like oh my goodness and then once you've kind of hooked them in with this kind of like bizarre alien creature then you can start kind of bringing in kind of other conservation messages or or you know you've got their attention then suddenly you can introduce you know, other species so, so 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 what i've done in the past with different uh, schools groups is you show them this this video so suddenly they're like completely set on invertebrates and then you take them out into their schoolyard in order to show them some of the cool things that you have in their own backyard and you know because you have that initial kind of spark and then you can begin to show them the stuff that they have in their own backyard and that's a really cool to be able to kind of have that hook to kind of make that link and then get them to be keen about the bugs in their own garden this is such a beautiful thing. I mean, it not only links with our backyard bio thing that we're trying for this global bio festival, but for me personally, when I was 10 years old, I went in my backyard and I counted species for two and a half hours. And there were 72 <laughs> species of invertebrates, 72 in a backyard in Toronto in a heart of a city, right? And so this is something that everyone can do, which is what I think is so nice about insects is that not all of us have mountain gorillas or hornbills or tigers in our backyard, but everybody has invertebrates. And so, you know, it's easy to fall in love with them once you've, you've gotten a hook with something like a titan beetle. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, cool. um, okay, there's no keeping you down, Eleanor. So where are you off to next? Is it for more titan beetle stuff in French Guyana? Is it for other work elsewhere in the world? Little bit of, yeah. well, well, at the at the moment, I'm I'm working on a illegal wildlife trade, which is which is really exciting. Um, but I'm hoping to get back out to French Guiana, and I really want to take a bunch of students this time in order to uh, to kind of introduce them to the French Guiana rainforest because it's a, a real hidden gem. I think uh, you know you don't hear about it so much, but it's got so much going on. Yeah, that whole corridor there. I mean, we've heard about Brazil quite a bit, Colombia over the last few mm. years, but it's like Guyana, Suriname, French Guyana, mm. like this is one of the most biodiverse regions of the planet. Yeah. And so what was it like for you getting there for the first time? Like irrespective of, of looking for this beetle, um, yeah. how did it feel going to a place that most people could not point on, out on a map? I mean, this must be fantastic. Yeah. 
was it was really really exciting it was it, it was quite funny though explaining it to friends uh, quite a lot of them thought I was going to France for a holiday and uh, and so that, that led to some interesting uh, miscommunications because uh, French, French Ghana and, and France do have a, not as many titan beetles there <laughs> no, no, exactly no. exactly exactly but yeah it was yeah it was really really exciting um and kind of very every time you go to a different research uh, center it's a very different atmosphere and there's kind of new people and and it's always just you know when you arrive on a, on a research center to, for me as, a, as, a, as an entomologist suddenly you're kind of like ah, I'm home and it's a, like such a great kind of feeling and the fact that you're surrounded by other people who are kind of similar minded and they're just so excited about all the things that most people kind of sometimes think are a bit weird so so yeah it's always a great feeling to be back in the field it's something that we keep coming back to with, with research field stations this idea of like you know you're when you're with a group of people where someone's like oh my god it's a big beetle and then like everybody runs that's a good you know that's the sort of people that you want to hang out with in life <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, Particularly like tarantulas or something like that. <laughs> oh man, I, I wish we had more time uh, than the next two minutes for a couple more questions because we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> so for kids at home, I mean, again, uh, going into your backyard, exploring, finding mm. your own biodiversity that is right near you is fantastic. What other resources would you recommend? Where can we send kids to learn about insects in a way that would you know excite them as much as some of the, your work has done? Or more relates to your work would be great. Yeah, well... Hmm. So, so I'd say that um, for, for me, uh, a really important part is um, going to natural history museums, and um, I'd very much encourage uh, people, people who work in in museums, and myself, you know, previously having worked in museums, they're so excited about their their, their species. So, if you have a, a species, I was really lucky in that I found out about these titan beetles. So, I got in touch with one of the curators who was in charge of curating the section, and I like just sent him an email out of the blue. He'd never met me before, being just like, I just want to see these beetles, and he was so kind. And he took me on this tour and showed me all of these these things. So there are so many people at museums who you can connect with and you can chat to who would be able to, you know, help you to learn more or, or point you in the directions of the right specimens and that kind of thing. So, so I'd say that museums have like a really great kind of potential to, to, to provide that. Well, and the London Natural History Museum is one of the gems of the entire planet Earth. Um, yeah. But this is a great message. Like scientists don't bite. Like most people are as maybe not as excited as you, but most people are excited to share the things that they're passionate about with the public. So reach out to scientists, reach out to academics. If you love some of the groups we worked with today, yeah. send them an email, see what happens. I mean, there's no harm in trying. In the worst case, you get to know and find another way to go and for <laughs> some of your favorite things. Yeah. Exactly. And often scientists are so so keen to kind of share, share their own research. You know, I sometimes get get, get emails from from the general public like asking whether you know i could share some of my papers and like i'm always like so excited to do that because i'm just like oh my goodness there's someone who actually cares about what i study um so so you know a lot of scientists are like that and so they're very very keen to connect with people if you're interested in their work man my face hurts from smiling that's a good sign um, <laughs> if i was tired before it's over now eleanor you did it um who needs coffee when there's titan beetles uh Eleanor, before, you know, again, I wish we could keep going. We're almost time to, to go on with our next session. So before we wrap up, is there any last message you want to share about your own work to get kids excited about bugs? I mean, from, again, all over the world, we've got people tuning in for this. Let's get people outside. Are... Yeah. Oh, well, I'd say, well, I, I have to have a message about uh, wood lice because, uh, because that's, that, that's, that's what I study. So wood lice have personalities, guys. Like, okay. You get out there, find a woodlouse, and and uh, you know you would know that you found a creature with an individual personality. And I feel like most people would be able to uh, <laughs> to, to find a, a woodlouse. So I recommend that you do that. Absolutely. So you've got a lot more going for them than people realize. <laughs> I find so fun experiments you can do in your backyard if you have like a trail of ants or a bunch of bugs you put like a piece of grass in front of them and you watch that like different ones will like scare you away and run away and they're all scared and others will like I'm just gonna walk over this and others will try and push it and others will like get their buddy like what are we gonna do about this so it I love that message it's something that we haven't had yet uh so do check it out wood lice roly polies you call them too um little tanky things uh, there's lots of names we can use for this this amazing creature so Eleanor, thank you so much uh, for joining us. We really appreciate you being here for our BioFest today. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> awesome. Well, with that, uh, we'll keep diving in. Again, everyone get to your backyard. Eleanor, we look forward to sharing some of your own pictures uh, of some amazing backyard bio over the next few minutes. Um, I brought in Wes, who's going to host our-, our Good next morning. Day. Yeah, welcome in, Wes. I'm glad your power outage is back. Yeah, back up and running. It, you know, got everything recharged, quickly up to go, and I couldn't miss this uh, next two speakers or any of the morning once my power and Wi-Fi decided to play nice this morning. And so I got to see this last presentation and a little bit of this morning. What more? Aren't you jazzed up? Like I am so pumped. I'm gonna. I could go to walk. <laughs>
I don't know. Well, well, now it seems like you get a break for the next hour or so. You could go run around the block if you want, do a little backyard bio. I think I will. Good so way to start that off. <laughs> yeah. uh, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to uh, say goodbye to Eleanor for the day. We're going to go. Bye, Eleanor. Hey. 